so Eric, I mean, it's all well and good to do all this work, but I mean, given all the moving parts that we've discussed, like how do you make sure it's kept up to date? Do you have any kind of process you use regularly? <laughs> joking me? That's how you're going to set it up? <laughs> Have you, you been listening something? the past 45 minutes? <laughs> let's, do, let's do it different. <laughs> you idiot. Let's do it different. I'm going to do it different. Just say, yeah, this is what I do. What do you no, do? No. Nothing. I'm not going to say that. Two lifelong friends document and share their personal stories as they seek financial independence and to retire early. One reaches fire in 2020 during a global pandemic, inspiring the other to play catch up. This is Two Sides of Five. So some of the other things that we talked about, um, you know, healthcare power of attorney, those are some difficult conversations. Do you, do you have your documents nearby? I do actually. Yeah. I, yeah, I just too. reviewed them this morning. So uh, mine is called uh, power of attorney for healthcare. Um, so some, sometimes people call them healthcare power of attorney. I, what is yours called? I think it's called healthcare power of attorney. And then okay. at, uh, in the same section, I have advanced healthcare directives. Okay. Yeah. So in mine, I have, um, you know, you designate someone who's going to make decisions on your behalf, should you become you know, unable to do so. And, you know, basically a doctor makes that determination, but then, so I've appointed my wife to be that person. Um, and then I have, uh, an alternate agent I, I presume you have a similar kind of situation. I do. Um, and then it gives them authority to do all sorts of things laid out in this this document. But then I, I come down to the end of life decisions. Do you have do you have one of these? Um, I do clauses in there. So I have kind of three choices: <laughs> choice not to prolong life, direction to stop treatment after physical cognitive limits are permanent and have lasted three months, and choice to prolong life. So this is kind of like I think of this as the kind of Terry Schiavo clause. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you remember that case. I do. Uh, yeah. In Florida. Yeah. Um, what, what did you choose? I chose to prolong life. I've just done too much reading about coma and, and some of these other sort of, you know, profound neurological disabilities that perhaps they're not irreversible or even if they are today, maybe they're not in the future. So it's okay. a difficult thing to think through, but I presently as a, you know, someone in their late forties have elected to prolong, but that answer could change as I age. How about you? I chose to stop treatment after physical cognitive limits are permanent and have lasted three months because I, I, okay. uh, yeah, but it, it is such a personal choice, man. And, and I appreciate you sharing that in that decision for me was, do I really want my family having me yeah. around as a burden? But I mean, you know, in addition to that, things like um, artificial nu nutrition, relief from pain, donation yeah. of organs at death. I mean, these are all things like funeral and burial arrangement. You need to specify these things and not fun to talk about. And also, it's hard to read what your spouse wrote because it's hard just not to picture that eventuality Completely. And, and think, uh yeah, so. Yeah, I think they're the perfect example of the, the really difficult conversations that once you have them, you feel a lot better when you get out the other side because you've worked through some of these difficult, you know, just things to conceive, right? You know, oh, oh you're not here in this version of the future. Well, what are we going to do? How do we take yeah. care of our daughter? Or, you know, what do you want me to do if you're on life support? Right. Or, you know, it's there's there's a lot wrapped up in that. And honestly, most people haven't thought about that in detail until they're confronted with these conversations. Right, exactly. Yeah, or talked about it at all with their spouse or loved ones or whatever. Yeah. Where do these documents live? Like, I yeah. mean, do you just carry it around with you in your wallet or, or what? No, uh, good question. I can tell you what we did at least. Yeah. Um, so we have a physical copy in a binder. And if sure. we ma at make amendments, we add them physically to the binder. Okay. It lives electronically uh, in a couple of different locations. I have a, a backup NAS in my house that I have it on. And I also have it on a cloud server protected. I have electronic copies with our trustee. Uh, for the uh, and our executors for the uh, estate, and then I think also we've given a paper copy to the trustee. Right. Okay. How about you? Um. Yeah, we're not <laughs> we're not that organized, man. <laughs> we have digital copies all over the place. We have physical copies filed here in our safe, and um, that's it. 
<laughs> I mean, I've given information to um, the executors um, and people who are named in these documents. Yeah. Uh, contact information for my lawyer that basically says, look, if anything happens, contact her. And yeah, she'll, well, that's a great idea. And she's got it all, all the information. That way, it's kind of consolidated in one place. But, you know, if I had to think of the, the places where I'm named as executor, um, you know, like, I don't have that contact information from everybody. You know, my dad gives me a document once a year because I'm the executor for their estate, but, and he's pretty good about updating it. Uh, but like my sister, like, I don't know what's if something happens, I wouldn't know who to call. So um, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's worth kind of following up on. I know we're going to talk about this coming up here, but there is kind of an annual check-in and yeah. a means to keep all of this information updated. So, you know, your yours is a good reminder for me to kind of think about all the places where I should store it. But as just as I think about, like, if I'm going in for surgery and they ask for my, you know, healthcare uh, proxy, like I know who it is, but they don't yeah. have any document that, that says that. So I should, I really need to forward this to them. Yeah, that's a good point. I know when I moved a couple of years ago and got a new primary care physician, they asked me if yeah. I had advanced health care directives and they had me sign everything. But if I'm at a different hospital, that's a good question. How quickly can they get that? Or, right. um, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the questions that came up um, by our lawyer was um, Laura and I were doing a lot of traveling pre COVID um, because she would go off to a conference and I would tailor. Um, so it'd be, we'd be overseas. And we had the experience where Laura was hospitalized and we actually yeah. ended up extending our stay over there and didn't have anything in place for care of our children. And our lawyer basically said, Oh, there's this thing called parental delegation, you know, and it's actually um, pre need temporary delegation of guardianship pre need right. temporary delegation of guardianship. And that basically says like, if you are not around to execute the duties that are associated with your kids, like let's say your kid breaks his leg and they need to be admitted to the hospital, who is going to be in charge of signing the paperwork treat, you know, the, the permission to, to care. Um, right. and, and so, uh, this is something that she recommended we sign. Um, yeah. And it's, it, it actually doesn't last more than 12 months. So hopefully we'd be able to get back in the States and back by their side within a period of 12 months. So it's just not assigning permanent guardianship of your children. Right. But, you know, just think about someone who has younger kids. Um, it's, you know, if, if grandma and grandpa go, they have permission to pick the kid up at daycare or whatever, that's not going to fly if they need to be treated for, you know, health, serious yeah. health conditions. And, um, you certainly don't want them to become wards of the state, which is actually what happens, um, if you don't call out a plan. So, you know, all these things like, Laura and I were flying blind, man. When we had young kids, we were just like, we weren't even thinking about this stuff. So it's, it's part of, yeah, you don't know what you don't know until the lawyer starts asking you questions. So that, that's another, Completely. another document that we have. Do you have that one? Well, uh, so good question. I, I didn't remember this, but when I asked Lori about it, she said, oh yeah, yeah. You know, we've basically what we have done is written letters that authorize you know, whoever is watching our child, a grandparent, typically that in our absence, they have the power to do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, candidly, they were not notarized. And when I looked at the guidance for California, it seemed to suggest they should be. So yeah. I don't know enforceability or not. Again, I'm a terrible lawyer. Um, so worth looking into. Uh, but I know it's now on my radar. Uh, thanks to your comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't talked about, uh, I mean, we talked about the trust we've talked generically about the will, the will is just, you know, executing it's your last will and testament, you know, what do you want? How do you want things divided up assets and things like that, yep. you know, in, in the absence of a, of a, a trust that's going to do that for you. Um, we talked about the fact that that goes through a probate court and basically the judge will look at that and determine whether or not it's a, you know, legal document and, um, it'll execute your wishes, hopefully. Um, it doesn't have the same powers, I think, to execute from beyond the grave as something like a trust would. Like in a, in a trust, you could actually, you, you can specify many more things and directives and ongoing situations than you can in a will. So I think there's a lot more power to the trust. Um, there is. And you're also, you're, you're deeming somebody, your, your trustee, 
especially in the case of you know both spouses passing if you if you have a, a trust together they have all kinds of abilities you know powers to do certain things yes there are you know you write the rules and the laws if you will for that trust and they have to abide by them but they are granted, you know, for example, things like control of your investment portfolio mm-hmm. and taking care of expenses for the, you know, the child who is now being taken care of by somebody else. And they have to allocate funding and they, they can do a lot of things. But, yes, that is a big difference between a trust and a, and a, a will, for example. Yeah, well, and, and the, you know, the, the type of uh, trust that I have, the testamentary trust that's created in our will does some of those things too. Oh, it does. I'll, okay. I'll say that. Yeah. They're allowed to sell investments and okay. you know, manage funds um, to the benefit of your heirs, um, so, which we named as our, our children, obviously. A will will also, you know, it's obviously going to discuss your, it's going to talk about property and things that you're bequeathing to others. Um, and maybe it's even a listing of assets. Um mm-hmm. You have to cover digital assets. I'm presuming social media accounts. Like for me, there's the, that's a set of asset classes, um, and, and you now too, right? Um, you mentioned you have something called a pour over will. Can you talk about what that is? Because that's related to the trust, right? Yeah, that's right. And in, in the case of the trust, the pour over will basically makes sure that anything not specifically called out as assets of the trust, it provides a means, as I understand it, to get them into the trust so that they're covered by the same protection. Okay. Yeah. And it's my understanding that if you have beneficiaries named on, say, investment accounts, those things don't actually go through probate. They're they're actually transferred on death, right? There's like a payable on death kind of certificate that says assets transferred to whoever you name as beneficiary. Is that true? Yeah. And for example, the guidance we got was that the trust should be the beneficiary sure. of, of, of things. Yes. Yeah. But I think you can do that. Like, for example, if you don't have a trust, you can name a beneficiary and that is exempt from probate. Yeah, I think that's true. And it's actually really good guidance that irrespective of your own estate planning, anyone can and should go into their Vanguard or their Fidelity account and make sure that they've yes. designated primary and sometimes secondary beneficiaries for each account, because that'll take you a couple minutes and you can do it online with no paperwork. And and I mean, that's one of the easiest things to skip when you're first setting those things up because you're yeah. you're anxious to fund it and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll handle that later. And you never circle back to it. And all of a sudden you've got three different brokerage accounts and they don't have like beneficiaries or something. You that's know? right. So, that's a scary thought, but it's true. Yeah. And I, you definitely can't do that with a home though. So like, right. if you have property, real estate, it, um, that needs to that that needs to be handled differently and if you just have a will that's going to go through probate and if you know my mother's going through this right now with her father's estate because he passed away recently and you know probate is a nine-month process at a minimum and they could sure use the cash now durable power of attorney this was something that was just that we just received basically um and i you know, when you start Googling some of these terms like durable power attorney, general power attorney, like what's, what's the difference? Do you, do you have any idea what the, the durable designation does confers? I don't, I don't know what the durable part <laughs> means. I just know that if I'm capacitated, I can designate people who have legal authority to sign for me on anything, any legal document I would be signing. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of how I understood it too. They're like they could pay your taxes. They can do anything you could possibly do legally. Um, and they're acting in your stead. So who's your who is yours then right now? Is it your wife? Yeah, it's my wife and I have two backups listed in case she is unable to serve in those duties. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, right on. Cool, man. And one of them is you, so behave. <laughs> bad actors. Yeah, there we go again with the bad actors right here. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> Pay bills, handle your motor vehicles, you know, spruce up your boat while you're sleeping yeah. away there in a coma. Yeah, paint the trawler, <laughs> whatever you need to do. <laughs> All right, so I think that covers the 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 big estate planning pieces, but there are some other things that I think, you know, other aspects of being an adult as unfortunate as they are. And, and like one of them that comes to mind is insurance. For sure. Yeah. Big giant topic of insurance, Ugh, right? It's- so boring. <laughs> It is, but, but easily misunderstood or neglected, right? Tell me about life insurance. Cause like, this is always one of those scammy little product things that like, <laughs> I have like friends who sell life insurance. They're like trying to sell me policies. I'm like, what? 
oh, who does this anymore? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, life insurance is a complex topic. <laughs> it is absolutely something worth having until you're at the stage where you can so-called self-insure, right. where your assets are at the point where they can cover your needs. Because what you're trying to solve for is if you pass away and you're the breadwinner, well, what's your family going to do for money? And so having something there is is valuable. Many people choose, and it's from a financial perspective, much simpler and less costly to go with term life insurance that expires at a certain point. Or on the other hand, there's whole life, which is often pitched as an investment. And this is where yes. people get lots of thoughts about shadiness and often whole life insurance isn't a good decision. And I'm not here to defend or, or condemn it. But my understanding is that in specific situations, it might be a good choice, but otherwise not such a great idea. Yeah. So um, my wife had a, a term life policy through the lab where she yep. works. Um, and we just got to a certain point where we thought the, the premiums weren't really worth <laughs> what yeah. we were covering here since we were at, you know, we had a certain net worth. And so that's, that, that's where we both are, right? But, S same for us. Yeah. I carried a workplace sponsored term life policy until my assets reached a certain point and then said, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, totally. But it's not an investment. Like this is an investment place, no. but you probably don't want to be buying life insurance as an investment. So just put yeah, a do your in homework, that. do your homework. <laughs> if somebody is pitching a whole life policy to <laughs> right. you, there's a lot to it. We talk, it's yeah. often bad. Right. We talked about health insurance in the past. Um, that's an obvious one. I think that's on everyone's radar. Um, For sure. It's a huge expense. Uh, I think we beat that one to death kind of. We, we did mention in there that long-term health care insurance um, is a real slippery topic. Very difficult. Uh, bears a lot of careful thought and research there. And there aren't really great options. Um, and so if you missed that episode on health insurance, go back and watch that because there's some really great sure. advice in there about thinking about long-term care policies. And again, I think at a certain net worth, you're self-insuring. Um, that's right. And, uh, you know, there may be some catastrophic situations that that wouldn't cover, but, um, yeah, so that, that, that bears research. The other couple here, um, that I have on my list auto, um, Obviously, you're, you're required to, to carry auto insurance and how much you carry is is sort of up to you and your comfort level with um, potential for accidents. I have two teenage drivers in the house who are just getting wheels under them. And yeah. um, we have more insurance than, than we had in years past. And part of that is due to buying an umbrella policy. Yeah, absolutely. Umbrella liability coverage is another example of something that came up in that one of the first meetings I had with my then financial advisors right. as, do you have an umbrella liability policy? No, what's that? Uh, <laughs> I did not. And at least as it was explained to me, it's a means to extend your liability protection beyond what your auto policy covers. And for example, your homeowners or your renter's insurance policy covers because right. you don't want your assets at risk if something tragic happens, right? You've done all this work, done all the right things, asset allocation, asset location, blah, blah, blah. There's a horrific car accident, someone dies. You're liable, if you're liable for that, your assets could be completely depleted and umbrella insurance is one means of attacking that. The way I've heard the white coat investor talk about that, Dr. Dolly, is just that you want, um, in the event of something like that happening, uh, a big payout is what people are looking for. And generally a big payout is probably something around a million dollars or more. Um, so, you know, some people, the questions I had was, okay, well, do I protect over, how much? yeah, how much do I get? Um, and for me, the answer was in part done, uh, given by the fact that I have two teenage drivers and they actually wouldn't write a policy greater than a million dollars, which, you know, I could just then the alternative is to up my auto insurance more, right. or, you know, there are other ways of managing that. But, you know, I, I'm sort of comfortable with that advice. Like, you know, if something happens, a million dollar payout is, you know, that's significant enough. And, um, yeah, that's kind of how I approached it, but it's like, it's one of those things. It's like just kind of necessary when you get to a certain net worth. Well, and it's some of the cheapest insurance so cheap. you can get. I mean, totally. for a few hundred dollars, maybe you can ex you can have a million dollars or maybe dollars. even two yeah. million dollars of coverage, depending upon your state yeah. and your particular situation. Do so, you have two? I forget. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Arwen's not driving yet. She is not, but she is starting to think about her permit. 
Well, you better call that insurance company before I do. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> hey, did you know? <laughs> yeah, thank Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> the one thing that I have that you don't have or you don't have to worry about anymore is errors and omissions insurance. And that is, you know, if you're a professional, you're practicing in, you know, I don't know you're a doctor or something, you have some kind of professional liability, the potential for someone coming after you and your asset stack. Um, you just need it. So, you know, the, yeah, makes the sense. construction design industry is full of litigation and people who get angry and annoyed and bothered that they think you're responsible for something. And like building is really costly. So, um, I carry that, um, just every year again, super cheap insurance. Yeah. I mean, for, for the coverage that I get, it's, it's very affordable. Um, well, well, Eric, it's, you're right that I, that wouldn't apply to me, but you do inspire the thought that, you know, many people have small home businesses yes, have yeah. sole proprietorships. And you know, that's, it's basically you and it's, it's not a separate business as far as the IRS is concerned, but it turns out legally that's also the same. And this is why it might be a good idea to, to talk to an attorney and, and often they'll give you a free initial consultation to find out, for example, is an LLC, a limited liability uh, corporation, the right thing for me? In other words, do you need to protect your assets from risk that could come in the event of a lawsuit from your small business? And so I can think of all these different circumstances, sure. right? You're, you have a cottage food industry, you sell at the farmer's market. Well, what if a whole bunch of people get sick? Uh, in that circumstance, you're personally liable if you're a sole proprietor. An LLC might offer you the protection um, because it's now separating your business <laughs> from your personal finances. You know, those are things nobody wants to think about. But again, you want to have a plan. So, you know, consider whether an LLC or a, a different structure for a business entity might make sense if you have any kind of side income. Yeah. And I mean, this is one of those cases where it's so state specific. And, yes, you know, it is. I, even I, point. if I think about the architecture industry, you know, you can't be a, an LLC. If you're an architect in California, it's got to be a PLLC. And then, yes. and then you actually have to use your name. And so it's, there's a lot of things. And, and also it, it doesn't, you know, protect you if you're a practicing professional you, you you can't act with negligence and be covered like completely so that and i mean i don't know if that's obvious to everybody it, it probably should be but you know some people think that those protections extend to even negligent acts which it does not but there are all kinds of things that you need to protect against like if, if i think about clients who come to this studio you know and someone slips and falls in my driveway like without a professional liability policy here acting in force on this property that that's a major problem. Like the, my, all my assets are exposed. <laughs> um, and right. I, you know, even if I think about going to other people's homes to measure their, their home, you know, um, and some of the wealthiest clients that I have, the, the, I have to provide proof of insurance before I even set foot on, on the property because they have, you know, like, I don't know. I was in this guy's house and he has like a room full of Ming dynasty, like artifacts. Oh, wow. And I'm trying to measure this thing. And it's like, a, it's like this crazy room, <laughs> like just praying that I don't knock anything over. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I'm not sure my liability policy has coverage. That's That can actually replace these things. I mean, they're like irreplaceable artifacts. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the caretaker is like, yeah, you do, like, do not bump into anything in this room. <laughs> it's like, all right, God, I'm just going to make some guesses here. When I think about paperwork, um, you know, we've talked about beneficiary designations. Um, you know, if I think about like tax returns, listing of assets, that's another benefit of the trust, isn't it? Because the, the trust kind of incorporates all of these things into it, kind of collates them in one place. Is that true? Yes, that's true. And, you know, just thinking about what mine looks like, it's basically a binder. It's yeah. like a trapper keeper effectively <laughs> for the Gen Xers among us. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's sections in the back of listing your assets. And if you have specific things that you want willed to certain people, there's a place where you specify that. Yeah. There, there's all these little areas where you can collect information. If nothing else, it's a really valuable resource. It makes you think through that exercise of kind of characterizing your life. You know, when I think about paperwork and passwords and all the things that I have access to, yeah. like, do you, 
you use like a password manager, right? Do you, I that, do. Okay. Yeah. That's smart. I got to do that, man, because I, I think about all the things that are under lock and key that only I know. And half the time I can't even remember what they are. Like, how does that get transferred over to your, you know, your heirs? So that's a good question. Some things like the password keeper I do use have a, a function built into them to designate somebody who for a fixed period of time after your oh. death can request access because you've named them as such. But even for things that don't have that, I have this document, uh, which is titled like open if Jason is incapacitated. <laughs> and I update it every year. I, I have a calendar reminder for the first week of the year to update. It has all the phone numbers, account numbers, Damn. all of that stuff. I store it on a secure volume on a cloud server and on my local storage. And I sit down with Lori after I, uh, I update it every year and we go through it. And I, I ask if there's any questions. I say, is there anything that, that you wonder about that I haven't captured here? And we just make sure that things are in order. And then it goes you know, back under lock and key again until it needs to be updated. Oh, my God, dude. Every time we talk, my to-do <laughs> list just gets freaking exponentially longer. It's just well, dumb. You heard it, folks. The show's canceled. <laughs> it's just dumb. I'm <laughs> tired of talking to you. Thanks. Well, so we had a good run, 20 six or so episodes live now <laughs> no i i think this is great man i'm super i mean you know your level of organization and knowledge on this stuff has always impressed me but when i hear about because i feel like every time i ask you a question you're like oh yeah i got that and it's over here and i got oh yeah that's over here it's like <laughs> like little file drawers in your house for everything I, but i know i'm gonna give me too much credit dude when i show up at your house i'm looking i'm gonna ch check this out i'm gonna make sure all that stuff is where you said it is i'm gonna check that nas drive all and, right yeah. i'll show i mean i'm looking right at it it's just across the room under the tv you know one of the things i've realized eric over time is just how long this list is getting of different <laughs> documents for telling me this plan right <laughs> and Something I definitely did not do in the beginning, but the last few years I've been really diligent about is just putting reminders on my calendar so that at the start of a new year, I review these things. I have a, you know, I wouldn't say I have an elaborate checklist. I don't yeah. have something in Notion I can show you yet, but <laughs> I set reminders to review the trust documents, um, do yeah. my, you know, that, that, uh, you know, password protected thing I talked about that, you know, outlines all the things and just reminding myself these things change. And yeah, if yeah. we don't look at them, they could get way out of date quickly. And admittedly, I did not do that in the beginning. Yeah, no. And, you know, people pass away or, you know, maybe someone doesn't want to take on the duties of caring for your children anymore. So it's definitely worth a check in. I know um, this recently, my attorney called me up and said, oh, yeah, the laws in Maine have changed and we have to update this. Uh, document, you know, whatever power of attorney yeah. document, or, you know, I forget which it was, but, and then we had to just come in and get it signed and notarized again. And that, that, that's one of the things that's actually nice about working with an attorney who's definitely, who they, they have your back when laws change and they can help keep on top of this stuff. And she makes it a point to check in with you. I, it's not every year because I don't think, you know, at our age, things aren't changing all that quickly. Right. Uh, but she, she said, I'll make it a point every, you know, every other year or every three years to check in with you and say, Hey, things changed, you know, everything going smoothly because divorces happen. I mean, it's, you know, the, all kinds of things can, can change. So I think it's good to put reminders there. I have reminders like that for the business to check in. So there's no reason why I can't kind of add this to the list of things that just, yeah, it's a recurring reminder that happens. I don't know if I do it at the beginning of the year, but maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I have this one thought. I'm imagining somebody listening to this and thinking like, oh, man, I have like <laughs> literally none of this done. Right. And I think the first guidance I'm thinking about is just don't panic. Yeah. Right. Realize there's a priority order to this stuff. And we mentioned a couple things that are easily done on your own. And then it's really you got to think about your situation, and decide, well, what's the next thing I'm going to tackle? Because Anything you do is going to be valuable here. I mean, do, am I off base or what would you add to that? No, I think anything, yeah, anything's better than nothing. Um, and so if all you can afford is kind of a legal zoom set of docs or something you download for free online, cause there are f things for free online. Um, you know, that, that can work as a stopgap. I would say that of the things you can invest in, um, you know, working with an attorney to, to work on something that's specific to your situation. It's, it's like a, re, it's actually a really 
good use of your funds. And I, and I know you can get it done for a thousand or 1500 easily, you know, getting a basic set of documents in place. And then if you want to go something a little more complicated, maybe it's 2000 bucks. I mean, it's small money when you think about the ramifications that it has. So yeah. Um, but it, man, you'll feel like an adult for a few minutes. So, so there's that too. At least for a few minutes. And then your <laughs> kids will come home and you know, put you in your place and it's you'll like, feel uh, like you have no idea what you're doing all over again. So at least you can have this one thing in order. But like even the healthcare stuff, like you got to do that. Like the, yeah. the, you just have to have it in place, right? You That's definitely something you want to appoint. Like you need to have somebody who's being your advocate if you are incapacitated or unable to make decisions. And, you know, if I think about... COVID as just being this awful time where young people are going into a comas or they're being intubated and you can't speak. I mean, you need to write down your, your wishes. And I mean, you can, you can create a will, a handwritten will that's legally enforceable. I mean, you can do that right now. So, I mean, that's, the, right. that's no cost to you. Um, and so yeah. I would think you'd definitely at least want something like that in place. Totally. And, you know, to extend that point, any one of us, you could talk to your spouse or if you're single, you can talk to your parents. Make sure somebody knows, knows yeah. your thoughts on end of life planning. Those are not easy conversations, but no lawyer required. Um, and one of those people could, in a tragic situation, end up being the one who has to make that decision if you don't have anything documented. So at least make sure others know your priorities. And like what kind of music you want at your funeral? Yeah, I mean, you want to allocate all that. Do you want uh, black bats? metal? Do you want uh, balloons? I mean, what do you <laughs> want? You, do you want to be cremated, right? Do you want to be made into a life gem? All these things you can decide. I want the flaming uh, Viking boat where they send you out to sea. Yeah, you can you can get that in a lot of places. Oh, that, that's pretty nice. Flaming trawler. Right. Oh. Or do you live in a state where you can be buried in the backyard? Not every state allows that, it turns out. It's just a couple, I think. Actually. Really? Yeah, there are a few. Wow. Is New York one of them? No. Oh, you remember that house down the street from us that someone was buried in the basement? I don't remember that. Oh God. I had to babysit there, man. I was so freaked out. They're like, yeah, whatever you do, <laughs> don't close the basement door. I'm like, that's the only door I want to close. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No better place to end than, uh, stuff coming out of the crypt when you're babysitting. I had a skunk come out from under a couch once. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> Ever tell you that story in a house? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I was in a trailer actually. Oh. Yeah, it was baby. It was one of those like teen <clears throat> job bank jobs where I didn't know these people. They just called and they're like, "Hey, you want to babysit tomorrow night? Sure. Go out to some trailer. <laughs> it's one of those easy jobs where the kid was already asleep. It was like, hey, you know, just make sure if the kid wakes up, they're taken care of. Oh, no yeah. problem. Watch <clears throat> TV, have some snacks. I'm eating Doritos. I remember this vividly. All of a sudden, the skunk comes walking out from under the couch and just sits right in front of me. And I had just moved from, you know, suburbia a year before to, yeah. you know, rural New York. And the skunk just walks out. At least I knew what it was. I guess that was good. It Striped just sits cat. there. Eventually, I gave it a piece of Dorito and it ate it. And I was like, well, obviously, this thing's a pet. And I got home and they're like, I asked him about the skunk. And they're like, oh, yeah, you met Stinky or oh, whatever. Oh, Stinky, and of course. I'm yeah. like, seriously? <laughs> like, you don't tell me that you have a skunk? Like, a pet skunk. I hope it was skunk. like demusked. They, they did say that it was. Okay. Yes.